This is Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top questions and struggles. I share what to eat and how to move and how to think to get the energy and vitality you want in this second and better half. My guest today is best-selling author, consultant, media host, and master clinician, Dr. Joan Rosenberg. She's a cutting-edge psychologist known as an innovative thinker, acclaimed speaker, and trainer. As a two-time TEDx speaker and member of the Association of Transformational Leaders, She's been recognized for her thought leadership and influence in personal development. A California licensed psychologist, Dr. Rosenberg speaks on how to build confidence, self-esteem, core emotional strength and resilience, emotional, conversational, and relational mastery, neuroscience and psychotherapy, and forgiveness. Dr. Rosenberg has been featured in the critically acclaimed documentaries, I Am, the Miracle Mindset, Pursuing Happiness, and The Hidden Epidemic. She's been seen on CNN's American Morning, the OWN Network, and PBS, as well as appearances in radio interviews in major metropolitan media markets. She hosts the Mindstream Podcast, an influential and thought-provoking iTunes podcast. Dr. Rosenberg is the author of the number one of Amazon bestseller, Ease Your Anxiety, and of a forthcoming book describing her 90 seconds approach to emotional strength and confidence. And strength is the name of the game. We're talking about that today. Welcome to my friend, Joan Rosenberg. Thank you so much. It's it's such a treat to be with you. You know how much I love you, so I couldn't (laughs) wait to be here. I'm excited. So this is kind of off the beaten path for listeners, but, you know, here's what happens. And as I talk with Joan, you know, off the cuff and in the green room, and I'm working with so many of you who are listening right now in the pursuit of weight loss and wellness and fitness at any time, but I think particularly in midlife, we bump into obstacles And it becomes pretty clear, not potentially where they come from, but that the obstacles we have are more than just diet, exercise, and sleep. And you have another theory about strength, another kind of strength, expressive strength that could be relative to what's getting in our way. So tell us more about that. Let's dive in. Uh, Excellent question. Yes, I do have some thoughts about that. And I, and I, put emotional strength and um, expressive strength together because expressive strength is a big piece of what gives us emotional strength. And, uh, you know, there's, there's so many different things that get in the way of people speaking up. And the interesting thing to me is that speaking, difficulty speaking up are, let's see if I can get this right. The difficulty speaking up is not a speaking problem. It's a feeling problem. Mm. That's pretty deep. Okay. <laughs> so say more about that. Are we are we burying our feelings? The, uh, burying our feelings is one aspect of it. I would say more than that, it's difficulties that we have tolerating our own emotional feelings. So if I if I put it really simply, what what makes it difficult for people to speak up is that they find it difficult to experience and move through, handle, or manage their own unpleasant feelings. And go ahead. I was just going to ask, wow, you are very sensitive. Okay, you're yeah, about, She's I'm about a, to I'm ask. A, I'm, a, I'm a trained listener. Go ahead. She's got her shit together, people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's a family show. All right. Um, so are we conditioned to, you know, or not to be comfortable with those awkward feelings? Or is that more of a universal truth? Well, just nobody is. You know, I I would say it's tied a lot to our history, and it's also tied a lot to what we choose to do once we are aware of how how we were brought up. So if somebody, you know, if people grow up in families where the, the, the caretakers or the parents say, you know, you can't feel, don't feel, don't show me your feelings, 
you know, you have nothing to cry about. And, mm. or, or there's, there, or there's an attempt to talk about something that's unpleasant and the parent moves away from it. Well, the child learns that it's not okay. Or they grow up in the opposite kind of an environment where there's too much rage, there's too much chaos, there's too much unpredictability. And in an effort to quiet themselves, they shut down and withdraw. Or they never want to do it like what they, what they saw. And, and as opposed to doing any measure of a feeling or, or allowing themselves to experience it or express it, then again, they just, they just shut it down or they become like what they experienced. And, and of course, in the middle, we have people who grew up in environments where parents were sensitive and attuned to feelings, were responsive, and, uh, and in the moment could see that something, in the same way that I was hearing, you know, a swallow or something that led me to know that you <laughs> wanted to speak, um, it, somebody would have that level of, uh, not necessarily that level of attunement, but, but attunement to the individual to give them the space to feel and then to express what they were feeling. So it, it certainly there's lots of history, kind of a tie to our history, history that leads us that way. Okay. So potentially somebody else listening may think this, I don't know, but it, that, you know, I'm 50 something or I might be older than that. And I, mm. I still am feeling this way. I haven't figured this mm-hmm. out. Mm-hmm. Is that common? Uh, yes, it's very common. If people haven't spent the time to think about it or work on it, it's totally common. And the first thing I would want to do is to take that judgment away. Uh, th- mm-hmm. That that in and of itself is very detracting and will make it worse. It's like you learn what you learn when you learn it, and you have the awareness when you have it. And and yay, yay for you for being open enough to and present enough to to notice what your experience is and go, oh, okay, if I didn't learn it, now, then, then that's okay. Uh, you know, if I didn't learn it up till now, then that's okay. I will learn it now. And, and the, the other part of the question, kind of embedded question that I would hear in that, Deborah, is a, kind of a, a statement of, can I really change? And my bias on that is, if you have the capacity to think, you have the capacity to change. I like that. That's hopeful. <laughs> and I fully believe it. As long as we have brains that are working in a good, good way, then we have the capacity to change. So that that take on what's behind the fear. I mean, is there anything more than that than than our conditioning growing up, or what might happen to us, or how we might be treated? What else is behind that? Well, again, I, I would also speak to this fear element because I, I don't really, I think it's a misuse of the phrase. And, and uh, so let me, let me go through a couple different layers. Mm-hmm. Let me go, hit, hit some of the reasons people don't speak up and, and then I'll get kind of the nugget underneath there. A, a lot of people um, worry about what others think or yeah. they get afraid of hurting. Do you them. know my mother? Uh, actually, I'm not. Uh, I have met her in a different form, perhaps. Yes. Out. <laughs> yes. They get afraid of hurting others. Uh, they don't want to see and be seen in a bad light or be embarrassed or uh, or they actually they get afraid of losing people. But if I actually say mm-hmm. what I really believe and really think or really feel it's going to make you want to go away from me. So I'll hold back. I won't tell you because of that. Mm-hmm. And, and then another one is that I don't want to be seen as an imposter. Uh, you know, I don't, somebody might notice I'm really a fraud. Of course mm-hmm. people aren't, but, but they get into that. So that's, that's kind of one layer of things. Uh, and the second part for me is even the notion of, I have a fear of speaking up. I, when I think about the way the word fear is defined, it's about danger in the moment right now. So most situations, there's no lion or tiger coming after us. You know, that's, it's, that we're not, we're not being, you know, we're not about to be chased down by that. And the real feeling that I think about when people want to speak up is that they feel vulnerable. And I'd much rather have someone use that kind of a phrasing. It's like, I feel vulnerable about speaking up because I could get hurt. Mm. Uh, and, and of course you could get hurt and you could also learn 
which is my definition of vulnerability. So it's, it has to do with being open and willing to be hurt or to learn. So be vulnerable. As so let's, to fearful. Can we, let's put this into perspective for, for, for a listener and how yes. maybe not speaking up for themselves. Um, let me bring up a couple instances and see if this resonates and you can kind of overlay, you know, your voodoo. Um, okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. So, when I'm working with a client, a lot of times they won't kind of defend or stand up for changes that they know they need to make. Maybe in a household where there's a spouse and and other children old enough to make their own choices, and mm-hmm. those people are not all wanting to make the same health changes and choices, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it becomes mm-hmm. difficult for a woman to kind of speak up and say, this is what I'm doing, even though you may not be doing it. Mm-hmm. Good, good example. Can you take that? Good. And run uh, with yeah, it? Totally. Great, great okay. example. And so, I mean, obviously, so tied into what your work is all about. The, uh, the big question I would ask you before I respond to it is, what does she say as to why she doesn't speak up? She wants to, let's say she's, she's working on sleep. She's working on better sleep routines. She doesn't mm-hmm. want to go to bed before anybody else does because the rest of the family is up. And so she wants to spend time with them and doesn't want to, you know, tell them she's leaving first. Because if she did, then what would happen to her? Can't answer that for her. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I mean, okay. So, so here, so the, she would the, miss out potentially, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and and part of when I was listening to your question, the first kind of go round of it, I would think that I was thinking about like I'm doing these kinds of, I'm going to eat these kinds of things now, and I'm, that's what I'm going to bring into the household, and then she gets, mm-hmm. you know, she gets lots of uh, pushback because of that. Mm-hmm. So, so in the in the sleep question, I would I would say there's a situation where she may be dismissing her own feelings and her own needs. Mm. In the other situation, where I'm going to bring this stuff in, or there's a reluctance to say oh, we're going to bring this kind of food in, there's a concern about the pushback. So, but let me let me speak to that more broadly because this will get at kind of a, a core piece about why people don't speak up. So, if I if I use my thoughts about really the big thing underneath difficulty speaking up is I have a hard time handling unpleasant feelings. Think about that as a discomfort with my own emotional discomfort. I have to let it land. <laughs> yeah. Okay. You okay. do. No. All yeah. Right. Thank you for the pause. Yeah. You're, you're, you're welcome. It's it's so so I, there's I, I so now if I have a hard time dealing with my own unpleasant feelings, uh, there's discomfort with my own emotional discomfort. To be in conversation with you and to say I'm bringing in these foods, organic, and we're going to eat more vegetables, and no, the chips go, and so do the pies and ice cream, and there's anticipation of pushback then I have to deal with the discomfort of your emotional discomfort or your unpleasant feelings simultaneous Mm -hmm. with the discomfort of my own emotional discomfort. Got it. So I call that, yeah, I call that sometimes swimming upstream, right? I mean, you already uh, have resistance internally and now it's external too. Correct. Correct. But I have to be willing to tolerate those emotions, those feelings, in order to stay the course, mm-hmm. and then and then I have to be I have to be willing to make a response to the response. Got it. Okay. So I think we just discovered the secret is how do we get comfortable with difficult feelings. Oh, <laughs> that, that, and that <laughs> takes me right to the essence of the work that I'm doing. Yeah, my my I spent years trying to figure out what it was that made it difficult for people to experience unpleasant feelings. 
and uh, you know, I looped into this one too. It's not like I didn't have my own struggles with it or trying to figure it out. And gratefully, they were earlier in my life as opposed to later in my life, but that doesn't matter. It's we, like I said, we learn it when we learn it. <clears throat> the but neuro neuroscience started to really it, it come out in popular literature probably about 15 to 20 years ago. And there were a variety of concepts that really stood out to me and helped me begin to understand this. One is that when we feel uh, our feelings, we tend to experience them in our body first. So feelings are, feelings are an embodied experience. They're just not in our head. And so one is that our, we're very well connected, kind of body, brain, brain, body, and we shouldn't look, them, look at them as separate. We should really see that as ourselves as one interconnected whole. And when a feeling fires off in our bodies, then it activates bodily sensations. And it's those bodily sensations that help us know what we're feeling emotionally. And Got it. And what I started to realize is that it's not that somebody didn't want to feel their feelings. Now, again, pleasant ones we do pretty well. It's the unpleasant ones that are hard. And it wasn't a situation where people didn't want to feel those. I came to believe that what they didn't want to feel were the bodily sensations that helped them know what they were feeling emotionally. Hmm. So that if I could just get people to understand that all they had to do was to kind of ride the wave of, those bodily sensations, then they could actually stay present to the unpleasant feeling that existed. And when we cut off from those unpleasant feelings, we're cutting off from, you know, 50% of the information that we have coming in. So I want people to have full use of the full range of the feelings. Powerful. And that's that data. Sense. Isn't it data and yeah, information yeah. that we can use to figure out why why we're not where we want to be right now? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. But it's not making the feeling as permanent. It's understanding. It's, it's a transient and it's informative in the moment. So how can, I, how can I make use of the information? Just like I have thoughts or just like I read something, how can I make use of the incoming data, if you will, to then make decisions based on that? But people will doubt their feelings. They'll question them. They'll dismiss them. They'll distract from them. They'll cut off from them. Uh, Again, on and on and on. And I think the effort, all those efforts are really to get away from the bodily experience of the feeling. Okay, so I've got a question, <laughs> and it, this comes up probably more easily related to food for for listeners than I think with exercise, but that may may also tie in there. Mm-hmm. It's just mm-hmm. one one is typically a something that we do, and the other one is something that we avoid doing. So. With food, we we can't get away from not doing it all together. With exercise, I would argue you can't do that either, but some people can do that. So with nutrition, let's say there is something that you know you need to give up. Maybe it's processed foods or maybe it is the, the pies and the brownies, the chips that are not serving you well for the goals mm-hmm. that you want. Mm-hmm. And yet... When when someone is potentially struggling with these emotions and the resistance, they actually often go back to that very thing. And it it seems outwardly, and I may be using the wrong words, but it's like punishment. You know, what they feel might be deprivation by not allowing themselves to have it end up being punishment when they do because of the feelings that follow it. Sure. Yep. Mm hmm. So is there a a trick, (laughs) Dr. Rosenberg, for Uh, avoiding that or working through it? Well, yeah, I mean, it's double layered, actually. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, yes, I I believe so. So when I think of people who 
have these kinds of struggles, I think of it as not, in this case, it's not eating, eating, eating management. It's actually emotion, emotional management. Mm-hmm. So that what ends up happening is that the food becomes the, dist- the distractor and in its own way becomes the punishment. And once I eat, now I can focus on the fact that I ate the stuff and then beat myself up for that as opposed to the uncomfortable feeling that I didn't want to feel about not eating it in the first place. So it's all, so it's all, it's, it's, go ahead. Am I, am I interpreting that being angry with yourself is an easier emotion to handle? Well, being angry with yourself is actually not an emotion. It's a judgment. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Good clarity. Being angry, being, being angry is the feeling. If I mm-hmm. say I'm, Hear the difference between I'm I'm disappointed in myself as opposed to I'm disappointed. Mm-hmm. Got it. So once you once you're so and so for me at and at one I mean harsh self criticism is another really big thing. I just will jump up and down and scream and yell or in a good way, but all in neon because of how important it is to change it and what you're describing then becomes kind of a thought hijack of mm-hmm. unpleasant feeling of unpleasant feelings. How do you get somebody to keep coming back? And more specifically, how do I get somebody to keep coming back when they've experienced this cycle again and again? If you're listening and you've, you've started and you've stopped, this is for you. I, I, the, the key is I, what I used to ask people to do, and I actually spent time when I was working at UCLA in their counseling center. I, one of the reasons I was there was because I was I was working predom- again predominantly with men, but also with men who struggled with a variety of uh, eating challenges. So anorexia, bulimia, overeating, compulsive eating, and I what I would always think about and also say to them is that they didn't have any kind of eating disorder. They had an emotional management disorder. Hmm. And uh, so we can take it out of the the idea of disorder, but there's an emotional management problem going on. And and what I would usually suggest is that people take a minimum of 20 minutes. So where the urge came about to go eat and to eat the chips or the pie or whatever it is, that they take 20, they can't eat it. They have to sit down, they have to take 20 minutes and they have to stay present to what it is that they're thinking and feeling and or needing. And in the best of circumstances, they won't just think about it, they'll write about it. And I often urge them to take another step with it and that was to call somebody that was important to them and talk to them about it. And you know that after those 20 minutes were up, the urge was gone. Mm -hmm. Right? Because they were then dialed in and focused in on what the real concern was. The other, I mean, again, this extends out even further because many people who face these kind of challenges don't pay attention to their feelings. They don't pay attention to their needs. They don't ask for help. And people they claim to be close to don't really know what's going on for them. So by getting them to sit down and to think and to write or journal about it and and in the best of circumstances to reach out and talk to somebody about it, it was then it started to break all of those patterns. And then we were at the real problem, the real source, and the urge would go away and then they could move on in the way that they actually really desired. Great action steps. All right. That brought to me another question. Are you okay mm-hmm. on time, by the way? Uh, I can go as long as you want. A few more? Okay. So quite often for many of the women that I work with, evening tends to be the time when they struggle with these kinds of mm-hmm. challenges where they might be taking a 20-minute break and need it. What's behind that? Uh, my first guess is evening. there's probably less demand in the evening. Hmm. That that would be my first guess. And with less demand, then there's more open space, open time to be present to my own experience. 
Okay. And if I have to be present in my own experience, then if I'm single, I might have to get in touch with the fact that I'm living here alone. If I, or if I have conflicts with a partner, a spouse, or a friend, then I have to be in touch with that. Or, or I'm not really clear on what I want to be doing, and boy, it seems effortful to think about where I want to go with my life and then whatever those next action steps and the frustration I might feel when I pursue those action steps might be. So it's, I think it's a time where it becomes uh, more, a more inward reflective time, but then that means being in touch with all the unpleasantness, potentially, that I don't want to be in touch with that I can avoid during the day because I'm so busy. Got it. That makes perfect sense. Okay. One more. Can we flip? Sure. How could we how could we flip this to somebody who is struggling to exercise? And maybe as someone who doesn't isn't isn't quite in the flipping mm. fifty camp yet and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. doesn't love or hasn't bonded with exercise in a way that they're drawn to it, they know it'll make them feel good. How can we uh, work that, through negative well, emotions around it? Well, I, first of all, I don't call them negative, so let's take that okay. word out of it. Okay, good. They're, 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 so it's, they're, they're unpleasant, but they're not negative. Okay. okay. Again, because they bring information. The, <clears throat> there's a, in, actually, in both circumstances, the whole notion is that you have to think beyond the way you feel. Okay. Say more. <laughs> have to let it land first. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> I'm trying to give that landing time. <laughs> so what? So what I mean by that is that when we live our lives, we get accustomed to the habit of being ourselves. All right. So, so if I'm a self that didn't exercise, then I'm really familiar with the me mm. that is that person. You got it. So to put myself in a situation where I create the space and time to go exercise means that I not only have to think beyond the way I feel and the familiarity of that me, I have to be willing to feel all sorts of experiences, feelings, experiences, thoughts, whatever it might be, that are unfamiliar to me. And because they're unfamiliar, they feel more uncomfortable. So... So why bother, why bother to create a new habit of me when I already am really familiar with this older, familiar version of me? Pattern, yeah, I like it. I have to tell you, so here's what popped into my head. <laughs> this okay. is what pop culture does to us. So anyone familiar with the movie Hitch? Mm-hmm. What popped into my head is when Hitch is getting the guy to buy a pair of shoes and he says, I'm not thinking, I think these are not really me. And Hitch says, you is a fluid concept right now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what we want. That's what we want is for you to be a fluid concept. Yeah. It's a a great association. Yeah. So so maybe that's a new meme for you that you, you is a fluid concept. (laughs) Oh, uh, yes, that is a new meme for the show, for sure. Okay. <laughs> <Loving it. laughs> All right. Any other nuggets that that you can help listeners with in terms of fitness, self-care, and kind of linking up this ability to speak up? Well, the... It's so funny because we moved a little bit off. Uh, kind yeah. of off, off we're on it and off it at the same time. <laughs> the the there's a couple different things. One is in order then to be able to tolerate unpleasant feelings, 
have an understanding that they actually don't last very long. I mean, there's, there's a, a one neuroscientist that says that they last roughly 90 seconds so that when a feeling, when that feeling, unpleasant feeling fires off, then basically just be aware that 60 to 90 seconds, you're probably not going to feel it anymore because what's creating the feeling is again, lots of hormones rushing through the bloodstream, neurohormones, and then they flush out and dissipate out of the bloodstream within that period. Um, so that, so that the key is to move towards what's been unpleasant for you in the first place. I'll just be aware that we're talking 60 to 90 seconds, ride the, and ride the wave of those feelings. And then you can do the same thing as it then relates to speaking up with other people and understand that, that you just have to be willing to tolerate their waves, their 60 to 90 second waves as well. Is it one wave? No, multiple waves. It's okay. Just ride each 60 to 90 second wave as it comes. The other would be, or the, I mean, if there was something to latch onto around everything else, it would be to not engage in harsh self-criticism that I, there's, uh, it's so, so damaging. Um, and again, if we go to this patterned you, it creates a, a very, a, a very patterned you that's centered around feeling pretty bad. So that would be the other really big thing is is to break the habit of the harsh self criticism. What are the steps to do that? Have you got some action <clears throat> items? Uh, sure, a harsh self criticism is yeah. a distract is a distractor from unpleasant feelings. Mm. I don't see it as a problem. I know again, most people will describe harsh self criticism as a problem. I mean, it's a it's a problem, but I see it as a distraction. It can become a problem in and of itself, but I see it as a distraction from unpleasant feelings. So if you're in thought, go ahead. No, it's so interesting. Yeah. So if, if you're inclined to be harshly self-critical or engage in all that negative self-talk and beating yourself up, all those kinds of things, then the most important thing you can do is stop, be aware that you're doing it, and then and then ask yourself, once you've noticed that, ask yourself, what is it that I'm trying hard or what is it that feels so uncomfortable to think, feel, bear, or know? And then let yourself go there and then in all likelihood, the harsh self-criticism will stop. It's the, the key here is that, again, you're trying to distract yourself from unpleasant unpleasantness and it's a thought hijack of the feeling itself. That was a brilliant real, nugget. Of the, yeah. Of the real feeling itself. So that was huge. Listeners, cool. I hope you're letting that sink in. Yeah. Okay. Joan, we yeah. covered a lot of ground today. Is there a question that you wish I would have asked you but I did not? No, actually, you did it because we got to the heart self criticism piece. So, uh, I, I just that those two things: the importance of of understanding that your expressive strength, your express, your express. Well, yes, I, I guess I will. Expressive strength is tied closely to how emotionally strong you feel, and in order to really feel the kind of confidence and have the perseverance and everything else that you want to have. Um, being able to speak speak your mind, your truthful mind, in a positive, kind, and in well-intentioned way is super, super important. So I want you to develop your expressive strength. And then the second would be to, uh, I guess, develop your mental strength and not, uh, and not let yourself engage in heart self-criticism. That would be what we, we covered both. Fantastic. Okay. And I can't imagine we dropped a lot of little hints about great things that you have as resources for any listeners. What's the best place for a listener to get more Joan? Uh, Dr. Joan Rosenberg. There's a link. There's certainly links to the podcast. There's links to at least one of the TED Talks, uh, but certainly they can get to the second one from there. And there's some uh, blogs and some other things uh, to, that are up. So there's a variety of there's a variety of things that people can watch and listen to that are on the site. And then I guess the other piece, of course, would be to watch for the book to come out uh, in the early in 2019. Fantastic. 
Okay. So everybody is listening. The link will be there, drjoanrosenberg.com, in case you're wondering exactly how do I spell that. It's E-R-G, but I will uh, link to that. And if there's a question that we missed and you have, leave it below the show link at flipping50.com. I love hearing from you. And if this episode was helpful, please leave a rating in iTunes and then share it with a friend. Surround yourself with a supportive community of women on the same journey. And to get the most from this week's episode, check out today's show notes at flipping50.com forward slash podcast, where you'll get the juicy download that you can get from Joan's site, but also I'll share some notes so you can refer back to exactly where they are in the podcast. What are you waiting for? Let's start flipping 50 together.